Well, thank you for getting up this early in the morning. I try not to rise before noon. I explain that by saying the world is round and it doesn't matter when I get up, but I'm just lazy. Obviously, the question that everybody in the industry wants to know is, what is the future of the price of oil? And everybody's looking at the markets, and everybody's looking at productivity and demand, and everybody's looking at the wrong thing. The price of oil, above all, is set geopolitically. It is set by the condition of the international system. It is defined by wars, social instability, economic forces too. But ever since coal began to be a hydrocarbon that we use, the outcome of oil, of coal, of gas, has been national power. The means of achieving this has been national power. We talk about what the Saudis are going to do. Remember, Saudi Arabia was invented by the British. Jordan was invented by the British. Russian oil was invented by the Soviets. To ignore the military, to ignore the political, is to ignore the economic. And one of the reasons I will argue that particularly the American oil industry is constantly surprised by shifts in oil, shifts that cannot be fully explained by the natural supply and demand movements of the economy, is they somehow have separated off energy from the foundations of human life. And something that is part of the foundations of human life is going to be affected by political, military, and all these other things. You are way too important to consider yourself just another industry. You are the lifeblood of humanity, and as the lifeblood of humanity, you don't get to set your prices by supply and demand as if you were selling computers. You're in a different world. And as you sell, as you buy, you must bear in mind one word, geopolitics. Geopolitics does not mean war. It means financial movements. It means political changes. It means war. And all of those things impinge upon the price you're going to get you're also at the crossroads of the world. In other words, every political pressure that you could imagine, every social pressure that you can imagine, every economic pressure is going to come down on you. And then you will say, well, I simply can't understand why the price of oil is this high or this low. Well, you don't live in a world of supply and demand. You live in a geopolitical world. And that world is predictable. It is as predictable or unpredictable as anything else, but it has an order. So I can tell you, for example, it really doesn't matter if Hillary Clinton has pneumonia. And it really doesn't matter if Donald Trump cheated on his taxes. Because when they become president, neither has power. Any more than Obama thought that he was going to be deeply liked because he was such a nice guy, or George W. Bush was going to get to deal with domestic matters, a president does not make history. History makes presidents. They are as trapped in geopolitics as you are. And that's one of the cases I'm going to be making today. How do you look at geopolitics? And then... How does it affect your work? It's a map up there. It is the map of the heartland of humanity. Of the seven billion people alive today, seven billion and change, five billion live there. 
What happens there defines how the international system works. Why? Because there are a lot of people there and they can bring a lot of pressure to bear. Some parts are isolated. The United States is, and I'll show you why. But in general, if you want to really understand what the price of oil is going to be, spend a lot of time taking a look at what humanity is doing. And to do that, look at this place. Something extraordinary is happening in this place. For the first time since World War II, the entire region that we look at over there is destabilizing. Whether it's the European Union, the Russia, China, the Middle East, there is one common reality in the world today, which is that we have not seen a pattern like this since 1945. That doesn't mean we're going to war. It doesn't mean we're going to depression. But it does mean that everything that you assume is going to be the case isn't going to be the case. When this region of the world destabilizes, the world changes. It has to. There are five billion people living there. So begin with this fact. One, this is what we mean when we talk about humanity. Two, this region has entered a situation unseen since World War II. And three, the price of oil should be rising because there's instability. And it's not. So we're seeing something we haven't seen before. Oil is highly sensitive to political instability. When there's political instability, it should go up. This time, it went down. So there's something very important going on in the geopolitical system that we have to talk about. Let me begin by saying that we are in something unique, which is a crisis of exporters. All sorts of exporters. Exporters of everything. How did we get into this situation? In 2008, the United States and Europe simultaneously went into recession. It was a couple of years later, but went from crisis to recession. Their appetite for imports collapsed. So if this is the heartland of humanity, the heartland of demand for nickel and dime stuff is the United States and Europe. When that happened, the country that was smashed in the side of the head was China. China exists, existed on exports, first to Europe and then the United States. Its entire economy depended on how much it could export because its domestic economy couldn't buy. Why couldn't it buy? Because the majority of Chinese live in abject poverty. The average um, income of a China, Chinese west of the coast is about that of Bolivia. This is a poor country. And the Chinese were producing iPads. Now, if you are earning $2 a day, you can't buy an iPad. We did research on this. I have a great staff. So suddenly, all the products that the Chinese manufactured couldn't be purchased. China did what any company would do under these circumstances. It lied. It began generating statistics on how well it's doing. Why? Because when you're not doing well, Generate statistics to show you are doing well. And you guys bought it. Between 2012 
and 2014, there was this great illusion that China, any minute now, would go back to the rate of growth it had before, without recognizing that the rate of growth depended on Europe going back to the level of demand that it had before, which it wasn't doing. But it was good news, and you were happy to hear it. Eventually, it finally penetrated everyone that we are not going back to the way it was. One of the things that businessmen believe in is going back to the way things were. Whenever things fall apart, we just wait and it will go back to the way it, does. it never does. We are now in the new normal. The new normal is the American economy is sluggish. The Europeans are one step above recession. The Chinese have cannot utilize their industrial plant, and therefore it follows they're not going to buy industrial commodities, in particular oil. What kept the, there's a worldwide recession. What keeps the price of oil at $115 in June of, 19, of 2014? I don't know. A worldwide recession, and the price of oil is at 115. Then suddenly, everybody at the same time says, oh, there's a recession. And all commodities go crashing down. Okay? And then there's a whole bunch of discussion of, you know, why and the imbalance and, you know, too much technology or too little. It comes down to very little. It's simple. Europe is in recession. The U.S. is sluggish. The consumption of goods is declining. Therefore, the production of goods is declining too. And if the production of goods are declining, then precursor materials are declining as well. We are now in the new normal. Until the international financial economic system begins operating differently than it is, and that takes some fundamental shifts in how things work, this is the way this generation looks. Doesn't mean you can't make money at oil. The question is, can you make money before you go bankrupt with oil? But that's another problem. That's not geopolitical. That's yours. Sorry, guys. So let's take a look in detail at what happened in 2008. The European Union was created for two things, peace and prosperity. They never considered what would happen if they didn't have prosperity. In other words, this was not an institution committed to sharing hardship. Now, the state of Texas was not want to help out New York banks. You ask to take a poll, you know that. It doesn't matter. It's a single country, it has the Fed, it has a treasury, they're going to do it. Europe is not a country. We call it a country, but it's not. It is simply a trade union. And the fact that the financial crisis hit all of the European countries does not mean that any country has any obligation to help any other country which was a fact that the Germans discovered to their delight when Southern Europe destabilized. Why does Southern Europe destabilize? Because the European Union was created primarily to benefit Northern Europe, and particularly Germany. Germany is the fourth largest economy in the world. One half of its GDP comes from exports. Germany is both the biggest addict of exporting of any country in the world and the most vulnerable. A 10% decline of exports, not unheard of, is a 5% decline of German GDP. So what do the Germans do when there's a financial crisis? They lend money like crazy. Who do they lend it to? The Greeks, the Italians, why? So they should buy their goods. 
Now, the German story later is that those wily Greeks fooled the innocent Deutsche Bank examiners. And we all know the Deutsche Bank examiners are simple fellows who are easily fooled, as if they didn't know what they were doing. Then they ran out of steam in buying. And the question came up, how do we bail out the Greeks, the Italians, whoever? And the answer was, don't look at me. I didn't do it. They were irresponsible. They borrowed all this money, they have to pay it back. There's very little sentiment in this area. Well, they couldn't pay it back. So what happened was austerity. And what does austerity mean? It means unemployment rates in Southern Europe at the same level they were during the American Great Recession, Great Depression. Unemployment rates in excess of 20%. Unemployment rates for those between the age of 18 and 26 is 60%. There is a social catastrophe going on in Southern Europe. How does this hold together? It doesn't. Germany can't go anywhere because it is absolutely dependent on Europe for buying its products. The Southern Europeans are, are, can't go anywhere because they can't go anywhere. They can't even buy a bus ticket. Who goes? Everybody who can. Hence, Brexit. The banks were shunned. They were stunned. Didn't these people know that the banks will now move to Frankfurt and there are no restaurants in Frankfurt? It didn't occur to them that, like Southern Europe, half of England was experiencing the same sort of economic crisis. And so you get the destabilization of the European Union. Now, why was the European Union built? To avoid World War II ever again, to avoid the rise of fascism, to avoid the rise of nationalism. What is rising in Europe? Fascism and nationalism. The Austrians are about to elect a guy who basically is a Nazi as president. Uh, Le Pen is rising. Europe is transforming before our eyes. Now, if the world depends on Europe increasing its consumption, it is assuming that it's going to get through this period of massive political instability very fast, like next weekend. And that's not going to happen. So you have Europe, which of the human heartland is the engine in massive instability. To the east, you have the Russians. And the problem of the Russians is they had lost their entire buffer zone. And the United States staged a coup d'etat in the Ukraine and then blamed the Russians for it. Very good, I liked it. The boys in Langley rarely get it right, but this is sweet. They took the legally elected president, called him corrupt, which he's Ukrainian, of course he's corrupt had demonstrations, and replaced him. We then condemned the Russians for aggression against Ukraine. And the Russians are going, WTF? <laughs> what, the, what just happened to us? In the meantime, the decline of the price of oil has meant that the Russians have, by now, this month, will have used up their first line of financial reserves. At this rate of consumption, they will lose up all of their reserves by early 2018. By all of reserves, I mean toilet seats, everything. They cannot maintain this level of consumption. This means that they have, on the one hand, a military crisis, on the other hand, they have a huge financial crisis. 
Why did the Soviet Union collapse? Two things happened at the same time. Ronald Reagan introduced Star Wars, so the Russians suddenly had to increase their defense budget magnificently, and the price of oil collapsed. There's a one major output for Russia, that's oil. One major input, military power, when they crisscross, which they have, they're in trouble. So what do you do under these situations? You lie. You pretend to be a superpower by sending 75 fighters to Syria. What the Russians care about Syria is beyond me. And you pretend you're going to invade Ukraine. This makes your people feel better. It also makes everybody very cautious about you. But Russia is an accident waiting to happen with 5,000 nuclear missiles. This is not a joke. If Russia destabilizes, who runs the missiles? You then have China. What happened in China? What happened in China was very simple. The same thing that happened in Japan. The Japanese built their economy on exports. When they started running out of room to export because of rising labor costs, they st stopped being the low wage, high price, uh, the low wage, low price economy. I remember when buying Japanese meant buying something that sucked. But the Japanese raised their quality and it killed them because now they were competing with the Germans, the Americans, and everybody else. And the only way they could compete was to cut the price and cut the price. So in 1989, just before they collapsed, their growth rate was 12%. But GDP growth rate doesn't take into account rate of return on capital. In other words, my uncle Louis had a dress shop. He made dresses for $10 each, and he sold them for nine, and he figured he'd make it up in volume. This is what the Japanese did. You reach a point that the Chinese did as well. And that point is, if you have a policy of not allowing unemployment, and you don't want social instability, then you must prevent companies from going bankrupt. The way to prevent companies from going bankrupt is you lend them money even though you know they can't pay it back. That means two things. First, inflation. Second, you can no longer compete in the world market selling schlock. You got to go upscale. Then you're competing against the Americans, the Japanese, the Germans. This is not easy to pull off. So suddenly, the only way for you to make money on exports is to cut prices. But you can't cut costs. So you compensate for that by lending money. And eventually, everybody says, my god, the Japanese are, the Chinese are buying everything. Do you remember when the Japanese bought Pebble Beach? or when they tried to school the Rockefellers in New York real estate by buying Rockefeller Center? Why were they doing that? Because Pebble Beach was not in Japan. And these guys were insiders, and they knew if I want to invest anywhere, it shouldn't be Japan, because Japan is in trouble. Now we see the Chinese buying farms in Zimbabwe. What? They're not buying farms in Zimbabwe, they're washing money. They've never seen the farms. Government money comes out, buys farms in Zimbabwe. God knows what miracles of alchemy take place. And lo and behold, a fraction of that money is mine and I have a condo in New York. Plus papers. What you are seeing out of China is capital flight. Legal and illegal capital flight by the insiders who understand that the Chinese miracle is finished for this generation. They'll be back.
but for now it's gone, and they're fleeing. In the meantime, everybody is waiting for China to return. How does China prove that it is a major power? It screws around in the South China Sea. You will note that not a shot has been fired. But we know that tensions are rising between China and the Philippines. The Filipino Navy chased off Chinese gunboats. You're, you can't get lower than being frightened off by the Filipino Navy. That's, that's the lowest you can get militarily. These are gestures. These are gestures that can become very dangerous gestures, but they are gestures of a weakening regime. And you also have an intensifying dictatorship that is purging people. The reason? They're corrupt. I said the Ukrainians are corrupt by definition. I don't even want to start on the Chinese. Whoever you pick is corrupt. What Xi is doing is getting rid of any potential opposition to his regime. What Xi is doing is intimidating everyone by saying, you want to mess with me? Come on, you want to mess with me? I'll put you in jail forever and your son and his ugly girlfriend. They're all going to jail. This is a leadership that is desperately trying to hold on to power because they understand there's a huge tension between the coastal region and the interior. In the interior, the average, there are 600 million Chinese earning $2 a day per household. 440 Chinese, million Chinese, earning between two and four. When you land in Shanghai, at Pudong, and you're driven to your hotel and everything, you say, my God, I am in Paris. Go outside the city 40 miles, and you will be deep in the heart of the third, third world. Xi is desperately balancing, as Chinese emperors have done for centuries, between the wealthy coastal region and the impoverished interior. When Mao Zedong took the long march from Shanghai to Yan'an, he went to the peasants to raise an army that ultimately overthrew Chiang Kai-shek. Xi knows his history. And he's doing everything he can to stabilize China. He may. But if one of the things he has to do is not give the President of the United States a red carpet and show it all over the place, that's what he does. He desperately wants to show his people that China is a great power. And so he will make gestures like that business when Obama landed because it plays very well. Trump is not just an American invention. Xi is a Trump. Putin is a Trump. Europe is filled with Trumps. These are people who see economic hard times and want to proclaim that they are strong enough to do something about it. Not different from the 1930s. It is how you take power when people are afraid and people are afraid in the heartland for a very good reason. Then there's, a mil then there's the Middle East. I don't know where to start. Well, yes, I do. The Middle East was invented by the Europeans after World War I. There is no country called Syria. There was no country called Iraq. There was the Arabian Peninsula, but it wasn't called the Saudi Peninsula. I'll give you an example. There was never a country called Lebanon. The French, for various reasons too bizarre to explain, but very French, 
owed the Maronite Christians something. And after World War I, they said, why don't we give you a country? And the Maronite Christians said, it's cool. And they took this little piece of Syria, which didn't exist before, and said, this is your country. Then they had a big problem. What should we call it? There's a mountain called Lebanon. Let's call it Lebanon. And this was the origin of Lebanon. The British promised Mecca and Medina to the Sauds and the Hashemites. They lied to one of them. If you've ever seen the movie Lawrence of Arabia, it was all about D.H. Lawrence dealing with the Hashemite king and lying like a mother. When the war was over, the British had to double cross someone and they picked the Hashemites. They took the Hashemites and put them in a miserable little town called Amman and said, this is your country. It had no name. It was to the east of Jordan, of the Jordan River. So they called it Transjordan. You now rule Transjordan. Later, having wanted to be sophisticated, they dropped the trans. You had Jordan. My point is very important, though. The borders that we see on a map are not real. They are not seen as real by the people who live there. They have no reality beyond the Sykes-Picot Treaty that drew them. And now they're coming apart. Partly because we invaded Iraq, but it would have come apart anyway. We just really helped it along. And it disintegrated. We know that Syria no longer exists. Iraq no longer exists. The borders mean nothing. The Saudis are hanging on for dear life. The Saudis were the ones who knew the best that this was nonsense because their entire country was given to them as a present. It's called Saudi Arabia because the Sauds, the tribe the Sauds, were given it. How did they solve their problem? With money. The Sauds were loaded with money for the past 20, 30 years. And they handed out money to various tribes to get them to shut up. What happened this time? They're really hurting. They're hurting because they borrowed a huge amount of money to modernize their economy. In other words, get away from oil. Much of that was stolen. That which wasn't stolen was misused. So now we have a young 30-year-old prince who's going to solve everything. By the time you reach a point in a country like Saudi Arabia, where the last king was 87,000 years old, and his successor was 78,000 years old, and you're giving power to a 30-year-old, you are desperately out of ideas. All right? I mean, this is not what they do there. So when the Americans see this, hey, they got a young, sharp guy. If he wouldn't be a Goldman, there he'd be a Goldman Sachs. Great guy. No. This is a Hail Mary throw that somebody with confidence will pull something off. And he has a plan in 20 years to transform Saudi Arabia. Hasn't been done in 2000. He'll do it in 20. Yeah, right. What doesn't he have money for? To pay off ISIS, to pay off Assad's enemies, to pay off Assad. Therefore, the basic flywheel of geopolitics in a region that is inherently unstable, that inherently shouldn't be there in this way, has been oil money. And because it should be oil money, and the price of oil has collapsed, and he's got all his relatives and aunts and uncles who expect to be paid, the Saudis are out of money. 
all of the oil producers, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Azerbaijan, wherever you want to go, they're out of money. And therefore, the only way they can survive in this situation is pumping like crazy. So the Russians and the Saudis are going to meet and they're going to say, we're going to cut our oil production. Okay, how much do we have to raise the price to make up for the cut? And they shake hands and they smile and they go away saying, what are you out of your mind? Well, maybe the schmuck will cut his political prices. <laughs> I don't know. This is what, what goes on. And now we start getting to the question, you know, as we look at this entire crisis, of what is keeping oil prices down in a time of institutional geopolitical crisis. The oil producers, during the period when they had high prices, massively increased production and leveraged themselves, which is another way of saying borrowing money, I think. They borrowed a load of money to be able to finance the expansion on the assumption that the price would remain high. These countries, because of the condition of Europe primarily, cannot maintain energy sales at anywhere near the level they need. And so they're having a race to the bottom. They're trying to hold on to market share in the only way they know how. The price of oil cannot be maintained because you have a worldwide political crisis shaping the oil producers. In all of this, there's one huge exception. Well, an exception. The United States. The most important geopolitical fact in the world is that whereas this area, the heartland of humanity, I just walk you through, I didn't touch Central Asia, India is not in special crisis, they're the, the usual crisis. I've just pointed out here five billion people, but the United States is in an extraordinarily good position. I know it's election year, so it's terrible. Here's the advantage the United States has. We are a lousy exporter. We're very inefficient at exporting. We export only 13% of our GDP, okay? 40% of that to NAFTA. I'm ashamed to say, yes. In other words, we have an exposure to the international market about 8% of GDP. If we were to lose 10% of our exports, I'm not good at arithmetic, but you can figure it out. It ain't much. Where Germany loses 10%, it loses 5% of its GDP. Where Russia is totally dependent on exports, where the Chinese are utterly dependent on exports, we're very inefficient exporters. We are not exposed to this situation. And that means that this is hardly you know, the boom time of all times. This explains why we are in relatively better condition than the rest of the world. We suck at globalization. And we have a huge domestic market that continues to consume at incredibly low cost. The Fed is not crazy, it's not stupid. I mean, you read Barron's, you think they've all, they're all retarded. <laughs> they understand something. We've got to keep the American economy going because that consumption sustains us. And we definitely shouldn't sign any free trade pacts because here come the Germans and the Chinese parachuting in. So what has happened? We're not signing any paid trade pacts. And 
We're keeping money prices low. And even Trump knows he's not cutting NAFTA. Do you know why? You know what states export more to Texas than any other place in the world? California, Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. I say New Texas and United California, these are the two biggest states in the union. Do you know how many seats they hold in Congress? I don't either, but it's a lot. You, you're not going to screw with Texas's number one export partner, and you're not going to screw with California's. That's not going to happen. The thing to understand is that there has been a massive shift taking place in the world since 1991. In 1991, the United States became the only global power. When the Soviet Union collapsed, it was the only country, 23% of the world's GDP produced here. We controlled all the oceans. We got to invade anybody we felt like it and go home. It didn't work, which it usually doesn't. The power of the United States in the international system is stunning. <laughs> Don't shoot, Kapanaden. <laughs> At least I stood up. Meredith is proud of me. <laughs> um, the United States, with a tiny fraction of the population of the heartland, is really the geopolitical heartland of the world. Now, the, United, the American energy community has problems, there's no question. There'll be a wave of bankruptcies. You know, if I have a bankruptcy, that's a tragedy. If you have it, it's a geopolitical fact. But even so, we have a domestic market in North America, and one remarkably growing in South America, that allows us to be independent. When Trump talks about casting free of international obligations, I think he understands what he's saying, it's, but we have cast free of international obligations in many ways. What is the future of hydrocarbons? Well, look, you've been at this game selling hydrocarbons for 200 years. You know this is not going to go on forever, and particularly in an economy that is transforming. My God, we have an iPhone 7 already particularly as quickly as this economy is transforming, there are new energy forms that are going to come for a host of reasons, political and economic. I have written about space-based solar. I, I, energy comes from the sun. We, we know that. We also know that you can't do it on Earth because of night and clouds. We also know that. In space, there are no nights and clouds. There's only energy. And you can beam it to the Earth using microwave radiation. Now, out in Texas, we have Bezos and Musk. And who, who isn't out there trying to build rockets? Their reason is space tourism. Yeah. <laughs> Why are they so busy building rockets? Because whoever gets into space and creates energy structures coming from there is going to be the Saudi Arabia of the future. And who is the Saudi Arabia of the future? The United States. And you are in the energy business, and that is not necessarily a threat to you. It's also not in my lifetime and probably not in your lifetime, but you know, down the road. Understood properly, Texas, once again, is the heartland of energy. But I would take a very careful look at what Bramson and everybody else are doing out in the west part of Texas and ask the question of why they're doing it. They've not told me, uh, but I think that's the only rational explanation of what they're doing. My point is that you are in the lucky country. You are fortunate to be in the lucky country. 
since we're Americans, everything is going to hell, there is no hope, you know, we understand that, especially in election year. We've got a couple of doozies, I mean, <laughs> what can you say, but either one. But it doesn't matter. The American president is the least powerful leader in the world. Fortunately, we don't have a parliamentary system, we have a presidential system, and he can't buy a roll of toilet paper unless Congress approves it. And then the Supreme Court will find a reason why it violates equal rights somewhere, and he won't be allowed to do it. We have had many presidents, and all of them were made president under the basic principle of our founders. We want an inefficient government. Politicians can't be trusted. Let's build a city in the middle of nowhere called Washington, move all the politicians there, and let them chew on each other. In the meantime, Google, and Microsoft, and ExxonMobil will live on doing the business of the country. This is the foundation of the United States. In the end, the primary thing of this election is who we have to listen to for the next two years, four years. And let me tell you, it's a hard choice. But beyond that, they can't do anything. They're blocked in by all the things that made Obama incapable of doing the things he wanted to do. And they're blocked in by history and reality. So yeah, he wants to build a huge wall. I'm sure that when Texas wakes up and says, and California wakes up, he's gonna to get to build a huge wall. There's a reality out there, which is Congress has to approve it. And the two largest delegations are Texas and, United, and California. Maybe it'd be a little wall, maybe a fence. The impersonal is what you understand about geopolitics. It is not that I spoke to this guy and he said this was gonna happen. It is as impersonal as Adam Smith, writing in The Wealth of Nations. It's the invisible hand. But the thing I've tried to show you here is that it's a very different, dangerous situation in the heartland. We're in relatively good shape, and that means we'll be very careful of involvement in the heartland. Our focus is in the Western Hemisphere. Thank you very much.